Ah, oh, well, thanks for having me at EMF. I am Ben Collier, and I'm here today to talk to you a bit about something we've been studying, so some of the people in this room, uh, called influence policing. So I'm a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, but this is quite a big project. So we've got people from Edinburgh Napier here, but also Strathclyde University and the University of Cambridge. So the first question you're probably wondering is, what actually is influence policing? So influence policing is three things coming together. It's three phenomena that have come together over the last few years to make something new. And I'll explain what each of those is. I'll then talk a bit about what I think influence policing is. And then we'll go into some examples. So the three phenomena we're talking about are first, strategic communications. So essentially using advertising to change people's behavior, but not to make them buy stuff, but to make them do things like go to the dentist. Um, the second is behavioral psychology, so often called nudge. So trying to change people's behavior through clever psychological tricks that they don't often know are happening. And the third, and what I think makes this quite a weird and interesting new phenomenon, is the combination of those two things with the capacities of digital platforms. So the ability to show you messages, show you adverts in the moment based on very complex behavioral profiles. So I'll talk a bit about these different things, we'll go through some examples, and I'll talk a bit about why I think this might be quite a worrying move for the police in the UK. Um, there is a bit of a warning regarding the content, which is also on the website. Um, so there's no really gory images or anything like that, but I will be talking about police campaigns targeting sensitive issues. So online grooming, uh, counter-radicalization campaigns, knife crime, uh, violence against women. And so just to be aware, those are some of the topics that we're going to talk about. But first, so remember we spoke about strategic communications as the first of these three things. So this really comes from something called social marketing. This emerges in the early 1970s. So in the 60s, you have the big mass culture boom and millions and millions of pounds of money, expertise, talent, science starts to pour into marketing. And governments in the early 1970s really pick up on this and they say, well, what if we use these tools, so tools that are being used to sell products, to change people's behavior, to market things that don't have a product or price associated with them. So essentially, often things like health behaviors, getting people to go to the dentist, getting people to brush their teeth, getting people to eat more healthily, and things like this. So when this emerges, um, you might be thinking, well, isn't this just kind of the same as Soviet-style propaganda posters? Um, the, these often circulate on Twitter. My favorite one's the one that says, if you've washed your clothes in gasoline, don't dry them next to the fire, um, which is really good advice. Uh, but these are quite different, where Soviet propaganda campaigns tend to speak to a national audience or to people on the basis of their social class. In this case, this is much more drawing from consumer marketing. So this really tries to find out weird segments of the population, so people that like particular types of television programs, people with certain cultural affiliations, and change the communications for them. So the idea that if you're doing these health campaigns, you wouldn't necessarily use the same campaign to speak to an elderly person in Manchester as a young person in London, for example. So this is what we call segmentation. Now, these are initially mostly focused on health and mostly focused on awareness campaigns. So trying to get the public to be aware of social issues and then to sort of change their behavior. When this moves into the police awareness campaign, so when the police pick this up, it really relies on the authority of the police voice. So the idea people will listen when the police say, hey you, lock your car, because if you don't do it, people will steal from you. Um, and these tend to be focused initially on self-protection campaigns and really rely on this sort of judge dread style, do what we say. But these campaigns evolve over time. Particularly across the 1990s, you see a real change particularly in the UK, in the way that government thinks about itself. Government increasingly thinks about itself and things it does as a science, a policy as something that can be tested through randomized controlled trials, through testing little policies on different bits of the public and, and seeing what happens. And as the 20th century, 21st century uh, progresses, we see this really emerge as a new philosophy of government in nudge in around sort of 2007 2008, and this is particularly associated with the Cameron government, although the nudge units actually set up slightly earlier under Gordon Brown. So really briefly, what is nudge? 
This is the idea that government really wants to intervene in society. It wants to make people's lives better. It wants to achieve its policy aims. But the people who develop this say, we don't want to tell people what to do. So we want a libertarian approach to government, but one that's also paternalistic. So how does that work? Effectively, the way that works is they say, well, we'll let people make their own decisions about what they do, but we'll rework the environment in which they make those decisions. We'll draw on a hodgepodge of ideas from economics, psychology, not really much sociology, but other bits and pieces of behavioral science to sort of trick people into doing the right thing. So we can imagine things like putting cigarettes at the back of the shop rather than at the front of the shop, making small changes to the amounts that different things cost. So you're essentially increasing the perceived risk or cost of a behavior and decreasing the perceived benefits for you if it's a negative behavior. So a big part of Nudge is also communications at this point. And this is really where we see strategic marketing stop simply telling people what to do and start incorporating these psychological nudges, figuring out what's actually stopping people adopting a behavior and trying to tweak their perceptions. So up until about 2010, these tend to rely on what you would have seen with old style health campaigns in terms of delivery. So we're seeing posters in GP surgeries, we're seeing adverts on the radio, adverts on television. But obviously at this point we see a huge change to the structure of the information and media environment. And that's with the rise of social media and its associated business model, often called surveillance capitalism. So I'm not going to spend too long explaining what that is for this audience, but effectively as the story goes, the big platforms come along, they realize we want network effects, we want mass adoption, so they usually don't charge for their services or they offer them very, very cheaply, so you don't need to pay to use Google, you don't need to pay to have a Facebook account, and instead you're paying with your data. They surveil you, they collect information about what you're doing, and they monetize it. They turn it into these categories, these profile elements that people can use to target you now. This is a really radical change for government behavioral campaigns because now you're not just targeting people who are watching Coronation Street uh, via adverts. You're not just targeting people who are listening to the radio at a particular time. You're targeting people who've read a particular book last week, who are within a very specific age bracket, who are physically in a particular location. And this offers up huge new resources for developing behavior change campaigns. So, obviously the police get involved here, <laughs> because, which is very odd, because as a criminologist we're often used to talking about how the police don't really know what they're doing in the online environment, and they're really not very good with digital technology. But what we've found in our fieldwork is that all across the UK, and to some extent in Europe, police units are developing the ability to do these behaviour change campaigns using digital nudges. And this is part of a wider thing of the things that people are developing within prevent and counter-radicalization spreading out into wider policing. And so how this generally works is the police will have surveillance data collections, they will map the risks for different crime types across the population, and they'll then target different nudge interventions to different risk segments. Um, and this all comes together essentially as the police running domestic digital influence campaigns to change our behavior and prevent crime. So, I'll go through this fairly quickly. So, essentially, as a little bit of background, this really starts in counter-radicalization. So, in the UK, this is a particular unit called RICU uh, within the Home Office, and they really sort of are the ones who innovated this kind of first, these digital influence campaigns for changing people's behavior. So, this was initially in counter-radicalization, and particularly associated with their attempts to essentially combat ISIS, but using digital platforms. So. As this moves from counter-radicalization, it moves into all sorts of other types of policing. And it does this because if you're a counter-radicalization specialist, you might change your job. Tomorrow you might be a knife crime specialist or another type of prevent specialist. And so we see these approaches start to bleed out from counter-radicalization across different types of police work. Now, that's all the background. So the rest of the talk is going to be showing you what these campaigns actually look like. So how do we actually know what these campaigns look like? So two people did want to speak to us. Firstly, we got in touch with Police Scotland, who have a team devoted to doing this sort of digital behaviour change campaign. 
we got to spend time with them, we did some ethnographic field work, and we actually got to see a lot of how they target and tailor campaigns. We also got quite a lot of cooperation from the National Crime Agency, particularly around their counter cybercrime campaigns. So the NCA runs essentially a version of Prevent for Cybercrime, uh, tends to be targeting kind of young hackers in school, although there's some issues there, obviously. Um, but when we're interested in looking at the wider use of these campaigns by police, well, we asked the Home Office, and they said, get lost. <laughs> we're not giving you any of this data. It's national security classified. Did you really think we were going to give it to you? And so we said, well, yeah, fair enough. We probably didn't. However, um, this was before some EU legislation came in that really opened up Meta's advertising library. So we essentially applied as researchers to get privileged back-end access to this. What that essentially looks like is you get access, um, basically, a Jupyter notebook that you can run SQL and, uh, and get some, some details out. Now, you're not allowed to, well, it doesn't ban you from doing this, but you can't use that to copy data out of that platform. However, if you save it as a text file, you can just select it all and then paste it into Excel, um, which <laughs> is what we did. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not against the terms of service. But um, So, here are some of the ads. So, I'll focus here on, so I've never shown this to an audience before when I talk about this, because I didn't think anyone would care, but I do think this audience will find this at least a bit interesting. So, here's an example of what you get out of this data library. So, we can see the advertiser, you can see a bunch of essentially admin information. It'll give you a link to the, if it's got text in the ad, it'll show you that. It'll give you the link that the, what you get if you click on the ad. And it'll show you when it ran, how much they spent on it, who bought the ad, and who saw it. So you can see a lot of information about actually the demographics of the people that saw the advert. And, don't worry, I know it's tiny, but I call it this. You can see the targeting options they use. And so this is, we've spent the last couple of years researching what are these campaigns and how are they being targeted? So this one's been targeted by location. This is a counter-terror campaign. This is if you go within a radius of a particular postcode, you'll start to get these adverts telling you to watch yourself. You know, if you report anything suspicious, uh, if you see anything suspicious, report it to us. We were really interested in these long lists of individual postcodes in individual towns and cities in the UK. So, for example, in some of these, uh, you'll see some postcodes in Cheltenham, etc. It turns out, when you analyze these, they are high security buildings around the UK. So we did ask counterterrorism police if we were allowed to show this. So they said yes, so good. Now, <laughs> yeah, I will show you what some of these campaigns actually look like. So we see a bunch of different models. Um, we call this the risk model campaign. This is essentially a classic prevent style campaign. So it tries to find different risk segments for radicalization within the public and target them with different types of communication. So in this case, we have a counter far right campaign and this is clearly addressed at someone who's in the far right, a young, probably a young man. And I think you'll be able to see this, but this is how it's targeted. So we can see, we want people who are interested in betting, in first-person shooter games, sports betting, etc. So you can see that target there. But you overlay that on the next level. You say, well, we don't want people who are interested in animal equality. We don't want people who are interested in RuPaul's Drag Race. They're not going to be in the far right. We don't want people who like vegan recipes, <laughs> etc. You know, and you can see all this stuff. There's also behavioral characteristics they can target on. So this is all on meta properties, so Instagram, Facebook. You can see here they're targeting people who've engaged with content that's associated with football and a list of towns and cities. That is risk category one, the inner circle of risk. This is risk category two. This is someone else who they want to have a proxy, approximate effect on the other person's behavior, on this person in the far right. This is targeted at that person's mum. So we see Emma's an ordinary mum, her son got involved in the far right, etc. And it's completely different targeting. You can see this person likes Asda. They shop at Marks and Spencer. And they like going on cruises. So you can see they're building up essentially this stereotyped profile of this family. And this is the one that we really did check quite carefully with, um, to make sure we weren't going to go to jail for releasing it. Um, so this is the ad targeted at that person's dad. So it's completely different content. Again, we honor Remembrance Day, we're proud to be patriotic, you can kind of see what they're doing there. 
Um, this has some interesting targeting. So this is targeted at people that like Jason Manford. What? So we can see Peter Kay, Jason Manford, Ricky Gervais, Piers Morgan. You can see they're trying to build this segment of a particular type of guy that they think this person's dad is. But interestingly, they don't want people who like Ben Shapiro. So they, want, they don't want the dad to also be kind of into far-right content. They do want him to be a soccer fan. And this is the really interesting bit, which is the locations that this person, you see this campaign in. These are a list of tiny villages. Here are some of the villages this was targeted at. On the right, East Kirby, or Kirkby. Apologies if there's anyone from there. All Hallows on Sea, which is a big caravan park and a very small village. So you can see here, why are they targeting these tiny towns? So uh, this is essentially speculation, but we think this is coming from intelligence products, essentially, or ways that they're assessing risk in particular parts of the country. So this is what we call a kind of hypodermic campaign. They're targeting really, really specific groups in a really, really sort of trying to inject the message into the person in a really targeted way, and no one else sees it apart from these people. But there's quite different types of campaigns. So we also see police, this is a Police Scotland campaign, using the ad infrastructure for big marketing style campaigns. So essentially advertising behavior change in the same way you would advertise Coca-Cola. So this is a counter um, gender based violence campaign and essentially this doesn't target people who are at high risk of engaging in gender based violence. This targets people who are friends with that person. And it says, well, you know, here's a bunch of ways you can challenge this person's behavior if you want. But it's also quite highly targeted. In this case, it's targeted based on sexuality, on age, people who are in a relationship. Now, these are essentially big consumer style marketing campaigns. There's no intent to hide this campaign, it's going quite wide. It's released in the media as well. But you can also see it's quite odd for the police to be able to target me based on whether I'm in a relationship or not and whether I'm like, based on my sexuality. So these are some quite interesting things. This was later taken up by the Home Office for their Enough campaign, which is a hybrid campaign, also beer mats and pubs, this kind of thing. What's interesting about this is you can see a really weird aspect of the ad infrastructure. So you can actually see how many people saw this four to five thousand people and the audience size is about a million people so this is targeted just at men in England between the ages of 16 and 39 and the reason only four thousand odd people saw this is because that is just too big a segment it's like trying to spend a hundred quid getting an ad at the Super Bowl essentially it'll flash up for a quarter of a second so within the ad targeting infrastructure there is a huge really an incentive to hyper-target these campaigns because more people will see it because you're trying to reach less eyeball, fewer eyeballs with the same amount of money. This also means, because this is a bidding infrastructure, that if you target people that commercial advertisers aren't interested in, so usually people living in deprived postcodes, you will get massive overshow of your ads. And that has a real difference in terms of how the ad's taken in. If you see these ads once, you know, you might never even notice it. If you see it a hundred times a day because no one else is trying to advertise you, that really changes how you see the campaign. So a little warning about the next slide. This is the, I guess, the really grim bit of the talk. This is a really controversial campaign we found. So it's to do with um, essentially asylum seekers in Cali. So this is a home office campaign. Yeah, it's pretty awful. Um, so this is targeting people in very small, t so Calais and other small towns in France and Belgium around the coast. And this is targeted at uh, asylum seekers. You can see it's written in Arabic, quite bad Arabic. Um, and you can see some really clear proxies for ethnicity here. Now this is something that Meta does not allow. You're not allowed to target people on religion and ethnicity, largely because of US laws around redlining. But we can see here there are, they've, they've essentially compiled these ethnicity proxies that they're using to address people. Um, so these, the, this is the least grim of the campaign graphics. Um, a lot of the campaign graphics show things like military drones, uh, dogs attacking people in vans, things like this and saying really horrible messages saying, for example, um, you'll definitely die if you try to cross the channel, um, we'll throw you in jail, etc. So we can see here the idea is that this is about situational deterrence. This isn't about risk profiling. This is about essentially doing a really horrible version of, you ever walk past a shop with a, a plastic police officer in the window? This is what that is meant to be. 
But as you can see, it's ridiculous to assume that someone who has walked on foot from Syria to Cali is going to be deterred by this, is going to not realise the risk. So you can see, yeah, it's pretty grim. We were really shocked. You can all, and is, yeah, this is one I've been really upsetting, particularly one of the targeting options, I've not shown it in this segment. There are more than 65 different profile segments for this campaign. This is one. There's another one that uses people that are away from home. So essentially when the platform detects that you're not around your family, which is pretty grim. So we can see here another type of campaign. This is a really traditional police sort of um, content. So this is essentially inviting people to a, a kind of a round table with local police officers and the council talking about hate crime. So that's the sort of thing the police have been doing for a very, very long time. There's nothing new there, you might think. However, what the platform infrastructure allows you to do, if you're the police, is reach people that you never had access to before, that the police have never really managed to have a conversation with, speak to before, because they've got very low legitimacy. These are communities that often really don't like or trust the police, and often for fairly good historic reasons. And because we've got this really intimate form of profiling, you can see, and I mean this is in clear violation of Meta's rules not to target based on ethnicity and religion, because we can see all these proxies for, clearly for religiously observant Muslims. And you can see exclusion interests as well here, so not people that drink, not people that gamble. This is a really stereotyped view of the population they're trying to target. Um, and the reason I include this one is because you can see here the green segments are all um, interest categories. So it's things that the platform's figured out that you're interested in, either through the cookie network, through buying data about you, or by things you've actually physically liked on Facebook. This one, the yellow, so they've actually deprecated this. This is not, no longer a category you're allowed to target people with on Facebook. This is the platform essentially detecting how much you are engaging with content across the network during the month of Ramadan. And it's using that as a proxy for religiously, religious observance, essentially. Now, the reason Facebook has this is essentially so that people can target their own community. With, well, you know, if you're running a, a business that is selling products to a particular community, you're able to target them. But we can see here, this is quite an invasive thing for the police to be doing effectively. This is a really interesting campaign, and I include it here simply because it is a secret intelligence service campaign, but it also shows some of the different ways that law enforcement, the state, are able to use these infrastructures to get around the restrictions that platforms put on the use of ad targeting. So we found this campaign. This is essentially an ad for um, the Secret Intelligence Service. It's for recruitment. So it's particularly trying to get young people of colour to join SIS, uh, particularly in sort of cyber roles, digital savvy, etc. And we were really interested in the targeting. So first you can see Cambridge University you know, Oxford University is not on this list. So it's presumably they've got other ways of getting people from Cambridge to join the intelligence services. Um, but we were really interested in this list of postcodes. I'm not sure how well this shows up, but you can see some of the cities. So we've got Liverpool here, L82. So it's a single mid-level postcode area in Liverpool that's being targeted by this campaign. And now, I, I used to be a government statistician, and so I thought, well, Let's have a look at the census. Let's have a look at the census information for last year's census for the L82 district of Liverpool. And you can see this district is 67.6% black British. So we can see here the postcode network itself can be used as a proxy for all sorts of characteristics. So simply putting restrictions on interest and behaviour doesn't really stop you doing this kind of fine detail targeting because the postcode grid is so saturated with these other data sources. Now, where this is all kind of going, this is actually not targeted advertising this bit. Um, this is a slightly different thing. So you might think, well, hang on a minute. All these platforms are dying. Like, Facebook is just like lots of pictures of Jesus with 57 thumbs now. And Twitter is just mostly people shouting at each other. Like, you know, w w young people aren't using these networks. And as the police, frankly, they see themselves as having better things to do than figuring out what new social media network uh, young people are using. And so there's a platform, there's essentially an ecosystem-wide shift towards the use of, thank you, of influencers 
in these campaigns. So effectively, the police paying members of your community to promote behaviour change of different kinds. Now, you might well be saying, hang on a minute, isn't this simply the same as getting Andy Murray to endorse my healthy eating campaign? You know, getting so that's a really classic, like big new labour kind of thing. No, it's not. Because this is at a much lower level. This is people with sort of, you know, this is sort of mid-level influencers. This is people with, who aren't sort of earmarked as celebrities. They feel more like members of our communities. And so I think there are a lot of quite problematic elements with this as well. And you can see this from some of the language that's used by the companies that are, promote, that are essentially delivering this. So things like in, the police integrating themselves into black communities. Using that kind of language in your material doesn't really bespeak of much sensitivity I and mean, the reasons why these communities ha actually have not had a particularly good relationship or built up much trust with police. Now, so we're getting towards the end of the talk. Yes. Um, so I guess the last thing I'll talk about here is some of how we got into this project. And that's, we essentially found out about this through this cybercrime, counter cybercrime uh, behavior change program. And this is quite interesting because it's really changing how the police do stuff around cybercrime. So effectively, the National Crime Agency in the UK has a full prevent strategy for counter cybercrime. So you can imagine you've got the pursue elements that you would see supporting, so essentially arresting people, disrupting infrastructure, etc., um, from, from um, uh, prevent, but also targeted interventions at young people who have not committed crime but look to the police like they might be at risk of committing crime. So we're looking here at people who are neurodivergent, people who are installing Discord on their computers maybe, <laughs> um, people who are you know, interested in hacking sites, they're on hack forums, they're on this sort of thing, they've not necessarily committed any crime but this is about the police intervening there. So we're seeing a lot of this now with for example knock and talks, the police come round to your house and say we know what you're up to give you a letter saying, if you do this again, we are watching you, by the way, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, but also other types of interventions. And a lot of this has come directly from how the, the counter-radicalization campaigns that we've seen. Particularly interesting here is deterrence ads. So if you're in the right age group, if you search for things like booter and stressor services, you know, Wireshark, these kind of things on Google, you will start to get National Crime Agency deterrence ads coming up next to your search or on the websites that you're actually looking at these services, saying things like, you know, these services are illegal. And there's a, additionally, so they tested a lot, thank you, tested a lot of this a few years ago. Where we've really seen this going is towards a hybrid approach to make other sorts of cybercrime policing. So they have this prevent stuff focused at young people, but they're developing an influence capability. So when you see things like um, the Lockbit ransomware takedown, what we're increasingly seeing is these big law enforcement takedowns are incorporating influence aspects. So they'll get the lock, but um, they'll essentially take down these major services, but they'll also email everyone that has that service. They'll do loads of like essentially commissioned advertising to people that use the service or might be friends of people that use the service to try and spread this kind of fear, uncertainty, doubt within the ecosystem. Do things like running fake sites themselves. Now. So obviously, I've given a bit of kind of what I, my reaction to these campaigns uh, in this talk, but it's largely focused on the data and what we've found. I obviously do have a lot of opinions about it. I think this is a really quite a radical change for what the police are able to do. It is quite a radical new thing that the police are able to intervene in culture and behaviour in these really sophisticated and weird ways. There are really bizarre and complex privacy issues here. There's issues with transparency and segmentation. And, yeah, we don't really know what the wider effect of this stuff is going to be. If you want that data set, so I'm going to finish now. If you want the data set, um, just give me an email. I'll send it to you. Uh, we are making it open access, so feel free to play around. And, just before I finish, I wrote a book about Tor. It's now out. If you want, I have one free copy, so come and find me in the Q&A tent. And the first person who asks for it will get it. So thank you very much.